she just face, she just mouth all twist around to the right so as I can't shut it. She just ah, it's all red, ain't it? Been that way for eighty something years now, and I guess it'd be that way till I die. Well, old Mrs. done this to this face. You want to know about slave days, do you? Well, I would tell you what slave days was like. The master was a well-meaning man, but the missus was a common dog. In the house, she's so stingy mean, she didn't put enough food on the table to feed a swallow. Well, here's how it happened. The missus put a piece of candy on the washstand one day. I was about eight or nine years old, and it was my task to empty the slop every morning. I see that candy had laying there, and I was hungry. Ain't having no father work the fields to bring me eats, just little pieces of fat back thrown out from the kitchen every morning. Well, I see that candy laying there, but I didn't dare go near it because I know old Mrs. just waiting for me to take it. And then one day I was so hungry, I, I can't resist. I went straight in there and I grabbed that piece of candy and I stuffed it in my mouth and I chewed it down real quick so old Mrs. never find me with it. Next morning, Mrs. say, Henrietta, did you take that piece of candy out of my room? No, ma'am, ain't see no candy. You're lying, child. You took that candy. Dear Mrs., I tell the truth. I ain't see no candy. I ain't took no candy. You're lying, child, and I'm going to whoop you. Come here. Please don't whoop me, Mrs. Please don't whoop me. I ain't seen no candy. I ain't took no candy. Please don't whoop me. And she grabbed me by my arm. And she got her rawhide off of the nail by the fireplace. And she turned me across her knees while she sat in her rocker so as to hold me. But I twisted and I turned till finally she called her daughter. The gal come and she took that strap like a mama told her and she commenced to laying it on me real hard. But I twisted away so there weren't no chance of getting in no solid lick. And then the missus lift me by my legs. And she stuck my head under the bottom of her rocker. And she rocked forward so as to hold my head under the bottom of her rocker. And she walked forward so as to hold my head some more. And they must have whooped me near about an hour with that rocking leg breaking up against my head. <sighs> Next thing I know, I was lying on my pallet out in the hall and old doctor was there pushing and a digging in my face. But he couldn't do nothing with it. Seemed like that rocket leg uh, pressing up against these young bones just crush them all into soft pulp. And the next morning, I couldn't open my mouth and I feel it. And there were no bones in the left side at all. Well, I guess she got the feeling kind of sorry. Cause she got the doctor to come and pry real regular at my mouth. Out of while he get it so as I could move my lips, but they kept slipping to the right and I couldn't stop that. And ain't never grow no more teeth on that side. He ain't been able to, to chaw nothing good ever since. Don't even remember what it's like to chaw. Been eating lickets, stews and soups and such, ever since that day, and that was 87 years ago. Here. Put your hand on my face. Right here on this left cheek. That's what slavery days was like. It made me so I go around like a false face all my life with children laughing and babies get to crying when they see me. 
Cause it's been this way so long, I don't ever think on it. Except when someone get to staring hard, wondering what devil got into me, maybe this way. And it was a devil that done this. A she-devil with a burning and twisting in hell. Used to see her sometimes looking at me. Never did see nothing, just sat there staring without knowing I knew it. Guess she got tired of having me around, because when I turned 13, she and Master sold me to Master's cousin. Was with them when freedom come. And they let me stay on, same as before, except to give me a little money every month. Stay with them till I got married. Soon after I got married, I heard tell old Mrs. Dad. Didn't make me drop no tear. Live and direct from Lane Community College, this is season 10 of Diversity TV. If you are new to Diversity TV, welcome. Uh, Diversity TV is a weekly interview show broadcast live from Lane Community College. If you are part of our growing legion of fans, welcome back. Diversity TV's mission, and we accept it, is to illuminate everyday diversity issues and bring the mic and the camera to those who don't necessarily get it. To that end, we uh, basically have 10 seasons. This is our 10th season. Uh, relatively, um, our seasons roughly correspond to Lane Community College terms. So we've been doing this for nearly four years. And uh, this season, we've been looking at systems uh, so our guests have included Judith Castro from our Transitiones program, Dylan Blanks, a young black, black gay writer uh, from the student newspaper The Torch, David Wadsworth, uh, Celebrate Recovery, a Christian-based recovery framework, Christine O'Keefe, who uh, basically looked at Euro American history, and uh, tonight's guest, who you just saw, Shelley Moon, uh, creativevoiceinyou.com. Now, what's your story? In the movie Amistad, in preparing the case for the Supreme Court uh, for the Amistad Africans, John Quincy Adams asked Sin Q's story to give narrative voice to win the Africans' freedom. A previous guest, uh, Christine O'Keefe, again talked about hidden history among Euro-Americans. Shelley Moon is a poet, playwright, and proud instigator of social change. She's a seasoned performer, who allows the creative arts to inspire shifts in social consciousness and spiritual evolution. Her new one-woman show, Born to Walk Between the Worlds, creates a safe space to explore and experience healing from racism, sexual abuse, gender issues, peer conflict, and many other relevant social and emotional issues, and invites the audience on an authentic and impactful journey of resilience and restoration, leaving the audience feeling empowered, encouraged, and triumphant. Shelley Moon helps people find their voice and, to, and how to use it. She supports part participants in her workshops through the process of telling the stories they need to tell and letting go of the ones that you know, they no longer need. Through her artist and residency programs for school children and through her therapeutic personal narrative workshops for all facets of communities, Shelley Moon encourages opening and transforming and transformation for all who participate. And uh, we'll go with the second bit with her. I choose to live a big life. My words, fat, sloppy overeaters, spilling over the sides of the plate and sticking to the table. I choose to live a fat, full, fleshy life. No model thin anorexics teetering on six inch stilettos. I choose to live a big, conscious life, falling down sloppy drunk with intention, a husky-sized commitment to the big and tall quadruple four X, X, X kind of life, portly and profound, 
No soaked and saturated Richard Simmons sweat into the oldie, spare, and spindly kind of existence. I choose to live a big, fat, juicy life. Unwieldy, beefy, not stumbling around like some kind of blind weight watcher. Yes, I said it. A Jenny Craig crunching, swollen survivor, mammoth and pregnant with what is real, what is true. That there is a conscious thread spinning within me, carrying and sustaining me in the pit. Not through push or petition, but through grace. Yes, I choose again and again and again to live a thick, rotund, hefty kind of life because I can. Our guest tonight, Shelley Moon. Welcome to Diversa TV. Well, glad to be here on Diversa TV. I love the whole sound of that. Diversa TV. <laughs> Seriously, whoever came up with that one was good. <laughs> Where are you from? I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, but I'm more recently from Los Angeles. That's how I got to Oregon. Uh, well, it's not how I got, well, pretty much is how I got to Oregon. Well, it is a little hop, step, and then jump up the I-5 corridor. There's a few stories in between there. But yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. We, I moved here from Los Angeles so six years ago. So how did you come to Eugene? Because uh, it is a different experience from L.A. to here. You and everybody kidding. has their story. Now, you're going to laugh at this because, first of all, I live in Corvallis. So... If there's any <laughs> less culture diversity in Eugene, it's got to be in Corvallis. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I actually, my friends laugh at me because I come to Eugene for my cultural diversity. Yeah. <laughs> People are going, what? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, okay. what do you do? But it kind of, it kind of works. But you have to, you have to go out and find people. <laughs> is what, what I've noticed. Yeah. You know, if you want to, if you want to interact and have relationships with people of diverse backgrounds, you got to work for it here. Yeah. L.A., it was just everywhere, and you just dealt with it because it was everywhere. Here, people don't even know what you're talking about half the time. You know, did you remember uh, that guy who did the, um, the get your picture taken with a black guy right, booth at right, the farmer's market? Right, right. Okay, so you cringe a little bit about that, <laughs> you know, but there's, there's, an, there's, there's a seminal <laughs> truth in that. That is like, <laughs> where is everybody? <laughs> where is everybody? Yes, everybody I'm all asks alone that. out here. <laughs> right, right. Um, and sometimes if you've been here for a while, you uh, sometimes become kind of like the unofficial Negro welcome wagon. But, you know. Apparently, I'm, you know, it was funny. I was supposed to meet somebody for dinner that I'd only met once, and I'm not good with faces. And, and so I'm kind of worrying about it. And I get to the restaurant, and I realize, you knucklehead. He's the only black person in the room. There's like nobody else there. It had to be him. Right. <laughs> you know, right. so it's just things like that. Or you do like, you know, the, the positive version of drive-by. It's like, ooh, I see somebody. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, ooh, yeah. But sometimes the dynamic here is, you know, even if you do see somebody, they kind of pretend that you're invisible. You know, that's a funny thing. I, I find that more with students than I do with adults. Mm. But... And what I'm seeing in the schools is a lot of confusion, especially amongst the um, um, kids of color, uh -huh. of what to even call themselves, how they even, how they even identify. Where are you, wh which schools are you talking about? Corvallis, Eugene? Both. Okay. Both. I've worked okay. in both. Okay. And, and I'm seeing the similar thing. Racism is, is alive and well on our middle school campuses. Uh -huh. And, um, so it's middle school that you're going to? So these last two were middle school. Okay. Um, but I, I work with people of all ages, uh -huh. um, either in a school setting or not a school setting. But this happened to be in a school setting. And, um, um, and then try that on with, with eighth graders I was working with. And the first thing, I help them write their story. That's what I do. Okay. <laughs> all right. So really that bottom line it's how can I facilitate you in telling the story that you need to tell. How do you know that? Because it's, it's amazing. Um, at first, you get a fl first I start by setting the bar with my own performance. Okay. So I go in and I perform pieces that deal with 
issues that I care about that are meaningful to me. And the definition of a personal narrative is the story of an experience or event that's meaningful to you. So what I tell them is you, where you start is what's meaningful to you? What do you care about? And the eighth grader goes, what? Because <laughs> they're going, who asked an eighth grader what they care right. about? Right. So, so that, that's the hardest part, right? So right there. what do eighth graders typically care about? Oh, man, they care about so much stuff. Mm -hmm. There are people, sometimes I have people say, well, Shelly, you go into schools and you're bringing up, you know, you're just meeting racism and, and sexual abuse. You're and pushing it down their throats, huh? So, as if you are. It, no, it's as if, it was as if, yeah, as if we don't want to expose them to these realities. What happens is they write their story, and my stuff pales in comparison to what the reality of what so many kids are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Cancer, mm -hmm. I mean terminal cancer, mm -hmm. more than one In parent. them, as patients or as uh, or family as members? Or as family members, yeah. I mean huge. Um, I asked the kids myself, I said, is racism over? And nobody ever says yes. They say no, and I say, how do you know? And they say, well, I just, I <coughs> see it all the time, hmm. you know? And um, so, but what I have found with this program that I, that I work with, um, I use a process model. So as the kids process their feelings and their emotions, I'm asking them to feel is really what I'm doing. And, and academia is so focused on how you think. Right. Both important things. But we absolutely sacrifice the feeling part. And then we wonder why kids do such unfeeling things. Well, then we also think about, uh, for example, oh, feeling is just for counselors and for therapy. But, well, they have feelings. They're feeling beings. We are all feeling beings, right. you know. And, and, and so they, they, so we set, we establish trust and a sense of community in the room. And, um, we call it like little Las Vegas. What goes on in here stays in here, you know? And, and when, they, when the students see that I and the participants see that I'm respecting their private space, I'm just there to help them do what they need to do. Hmm. Um, and for example, I had a girl say to me, a, a young girl, 13 years old, she said, I was so excited when you came because I've had the story I've been carrying around for two years. And it was about her friend's suicide. Hmm. So for two years, she had this story locked up inside her. Was the friend 11? The friend, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a period. And, and where do you talk about that? Right. At? What I'm always saying to, to the participants and the students is, you know, there's healing in the telling. We know that from our oral history. I believe that stories save lives. I think that sometimes you need a story more than you need food. And sometimes a story is your food. Uh -huh. And um, so, so I'm really passionate about, um, about people telling the story that is within them so that, so that they don't spend their lives with all their richness locked up inside. And um, I'll give you an example of a, of a, of a young man in a classroom who was, I think he was 14, and, and he just was the most popular kid in the class, you could tell. So I, I usually spend three to five days per classroom and do, and do this process. And at the end, they have a personal narrative, a story that they have written that is actually gradable and all of that, but they get there through a whole different process. Yeah. Um, you know, so he just, um, he looked like he had everything. And um, he was handsome and smart and, and popular and all of that. And so he started writing his narrative, and I thought it was kind of, kind of like a travelogue of different places he'd been. But then he got to a place where he told about the death of his younger brother huh. um, in a horrible death. And, um, and it just ripped the family. And he has carried this death, this story around with him. I think this happened like four or five years ago. And um, it's, it was so fresh. So he got up in front of the class. Violence, accident? A, an accident. He was yeah. accidentally yeah. run over by a car. Yeah. And um, so he got up to read a story. And as he read the story and told the story, um, 
every kid in the class was crying. And we looked out there, I mean, literally, the, the teacher and I, you know, were, and, and he was crying as he was telling the story. So I just went behind him and I kind of put my hand behind his heart and I just said, you know, you can stop now if you want. You did a great job, but you can continue, you know, whatever you want to do. I respect the space, wherever you're at, you know. And he just was determined to push through it, to push through it and get out the other side. And he did it. He did it. And the kids, we just agonized as he got through it. But he got through it. And these kids validated him in such a loving, supportive, supremely kind gestures and attention. One of the kids said, Shelly, I think we should take a break. And I said, I think you're right. <laughs> good call. <laughs> good call. It was a really good call. And we did that. And we all just kind of cried and talked and processed together. And then later, um, after I had left that classroom, the teacher had the kids write um, what they would remember most about their time with me. And what this one student wrote was that, that she'd remember um, that for one day, it wasn't about who, how popular you were, or what kind of clothes you had on, or if you were in the in crowd, for one day we were all equal. Mm. <laughs> wow. So the story, the power of the story does that. So in my process in the school system, we work in the classroom setting for three to five days, getting the stories out and getting the stories written. And then we work on performance and, um, and getting used to being in front of other people, do telling your story. And, um, and again, some of the stories are stories that we need to let go of, that don't really serve us anymore, that I'm unworthy, that, that there's something wrong with you. And, or, you know, these, things, these doubts that we walk around in um, a lot. So, so this, is, this is a real opportunity for people to go within and free themselves with their own story, yeah. with their own being. Talk about that sto the stories that we need to let go of. Give an example of one of those. Well, let's see. Um, I think that that well for one kid was like i all when when she's the student she said well i'm always you know i can't do this i can't write i i can't write i have and and hadn't written all year either had proved it and just don't even want to go there it's it's agonizing for them to even think about writing and um and so that's so the story behind that is that I can't write, I'm no good at it, I shouldn't even try it, and leave it alone, you know? That's leave me alone. Leave Don't me leave. alone. Right. Leave me alone. And I got to remind me to tell you about the black kids in the schools, <laughs> mm -hmm. Cause what's happening with their, there. But, um, yeah, they kind of go, leave me alone, you know, even though they want you to right. help them. Right. They don't even exactly always know what they want you to help them Push me do. away, yeah. push you away, but no, no, come closer. Yeah, and often the, right. the kids who are having the biggest breakthroughs, the kids on the margins, will, will, often, will, will get expelled and remove themselves from the program or because it just gets so right. deep. Yeah. It just gets so deep. Mm -hmm. So we work in the schools with the counselors and the um, teachers. And what I mostly have been appreciative is if I've been, uh, is I've been allowed to work with teachers who don't feel they need to save their save the children from their experiences, mm -hmm. you know, like so if someone cries, it's not the end of the world. Right, it's right. a release of toxins. It's a healthy right. thing, right. you know, and it's okay. But to them, like the worst possible thing that could happen would be I would cry on stage. What is the parents' reaction to this? So far, so far, so good. Okay. Um, it's been it's been really good. Okay. Um, for a lot of reasons, for, for some of these non-writers, mm -hmm. they're writing for the first, they wrote for the first time for this mm -hmm. all year long. And you can imagine, so they were failing. And, you know, there's the benchmark grading system. Right, right, right. These are benchmark quality um, narratives. So they've met the academic requirement. And also it imp there's empirical evidence. Through telling their story. Story. Yes. That this works, this process works every time if you just trust the process. So at times it looks a little chaotic, at times it's, you know, it looks like different things, but, but 
it always, always results in healing or transformation of some sort, not just for the students or the participants, but for the people like me or teachers or educators or whoever else is involved. You can't go near this process and not be affected by it because it's all about being affected. And what I see necessary and what I, uh, what I think I fulfill in a certain level is, is helping them feel safe to go places that they need to go but they're, they're afraid of. So this one boy who lost his brother in, in, the, in this horrible accident, um, after the, he performed for the big presentation, so we do a presentation in the class, they read in the class, and then at the very end, all of the eighth graders or all the participants all perform, I mean, some of them perform in front of each other. So they get to be vulnerable in front of a larger audience. Like an assembly size? An assembly-like size. Okay. So, so um, not usually a full assembly, but, but like most of the Several eighth, classes. Several classes, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. a real audience, you know. And he got up there and he volunteered to tell that story in front of the larger group. And um, um, it was beautiful. So afterwards, about an hour later, he comes running up to me and he throws his arms around me and he said, Shelly, you were so right. It's so much better on the other end of a story. Right, right. <laughs> you know? It's like he just got it. The way through is the way through. The way through. So there's a, there's, um, I'm wearing several different hats here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I'm thinking about is, um, uh, I think it was Satcher, uh, Surgeon General, talked about how one in five, twenty percent of Americans uh, have some kind of undiagnosed mental illness. Mm -hmm. Now, when it's one in five of us, mm -hmm. what that tells me is that society is producing them. Mm. Hmm. And so it's not so much what's wrong with you because I mean that's kind of where the you know I mean my degrees are in psychology so DSM is focused on what's wrong, what's wrong. with you right exactly. okay instead of focusing on what happened to you right okay and if you had an experience that that's is a whole different thing right. that's a whole different orientation <laughs> yeah. right so the the piece about what happened to you and telling your story giving that thing voice because how do you make a sane adjustment to an insane situation that's commonplace mm -hmm. that nobody talks about? Absolutely. And that nobody gives you any training for. Exactly. With sexual abuse. <laughs> sexual one in three, abuse. Right. One in five. Right. And the numbers are low. Right. Those are low numbers. Right. And so people say, you talk about sexual abuse in the classroom? I, I was in a class with 45 kids. One teacher, 45 kids. This was a wealthier school, by the way. Mm -hmm. And just sexual abuse was happening. And they yeah, bring and the it up. Right, yeah. And They're the bringing it up. They're bringing it up. Right. They're bringing it up. Um, I have a piece in the show, the one woman show, that deals with sexual abuse. Um, um, so it's there, you know, for it's up to, to deal with if people want to deal with that. Yeah. Um, but my point is, is that... Um, they they are walking around our kids with a lot of weight and with the cuts and the arts programs in ways that when you used to be crazy you could at least have art right. <laughs> to, express to express something, express something. Yeah, right, right, seriously yeah, right exactly you know? right. And we don't even have that anymore yeah. you know so the fact that some of these schools and 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 for in one instance the MLK commission mm -hmm. and Corvallis funded be going to schools um, this can be these kind of this kind of program can be funded through businesses. It can be funded through all kinds of things. Anybody who's committed to the health and well-being of their children um, in the school life, you know, um, they miss the art. They love the fact that I give a full theatrical performance and that I perform for them all week long. Yeah. They love that, and they get up there and they do it, and they and they f they expand. Um, and they write me this all the time, you know. Um, and, and now I have, I went to Peace Jam this year for the first time, and um, half of the 
kids at Peace Jam I'd worked with already. Mm. Uh, because they were from all over Explain the... Explain what Peace Jam is for those of us who have never... Those Peace, of, Peace I know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Peace Jam is this wonderful international organization um, that, that matches up youth with um, Nobel Peace Laureates hmm. to create social change hmm. and social justice in the world. They hmm. flat out say it. So, so these are children taking responsibility for their lives and for the world that we're creating together. Um, and, and so Peace Jam, you know, so, so there was a larger community. Peace Jam builds community, and so it is born to be, walk between the world's personal narrative workshop. It, it just does. It builds community. So that when we got to Peace Jam, they not only were connected through Peace Jam, they were connected through, oh, I did that thing with Shelly. I did that, you know, I did that whole program. And... And um, they're just so brave. They get up there and tell stories that would knock your socks off, mm. you know. And they're not, it's not always like the worst thing that I, sometimes they're just, one, one girl wrote a, a fabulous one about Justin Bieber. Mm. <laughs> How much she, but that's what she's passionate yeah, about. Right. She cares about him. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a funny, beautifully written story. Who? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta know. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, in terms of like our stories and what our common story is, um, you know, stories that are common that you know are part of the identity formation of lots of different groups don't filter over into other groups. So, part of as an example, right? So, I'm talking about Martin Luther King, right? Mm -hmm. So when I mention Howard Thurman, they go, who? who? <laughs> Martin Luther King's teacher, the guy who you know, actually met with Gandhi that you know, right, right. told him about the nonviolent, how do you change? Not, you know, and America, a prolific not, writer. Uh, right, and a prolific writer <laughs> about. So it's not like there's no information right. out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, it, exactly. You know, and Bayard Rustin, who? Well, yep. he, he introduced Martin to Howard, you know, and, you know, gay, Quaker, you know, mm -hmm. who was also into nonviolent social change, you know, yeah. socials, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right, how do you not know about these folks? You know, and then I mentioned, like, Alice Walker, who? Because nobody yeah. tells them. Yeah. It, I mean, it's but I'm talking. These are adults, and this is popular. You've never heard of the col color purple, or no, you know, or no. you know, Alice Coltrane, who wife of John Coltrane, John Coltrane. who? <laughs> okay, right. You know, I mean, it's it's yeah. it's horribly inequitable. Yeah, it uh -huh. just is, and and what it does is. It's, it's, a, it's the sin of omission, mm -hmm. which I think is worse than being called a nigger, mm -hmm. to just not be included in the mm -hmm. discussion mm -hmm. or to not be included in the, the, the real historical fact right. of, of these people's existence and what contributions that we have made, people of color, that to just the way we live and do. You know? But it's almost like for writing it. I mean, remember how I used to be with the, with the, the covers, the white covers of the black music? Mm -hmm. Right. It almost, a similar kind of thing to me happens on a literary level, yeah. too. Well, literally, it does, because, for example, I mean, I consume science fiction and black science fiction writers, and mm -hmm. so one of the things I notice about, like, Octavia Butler. I, I met her. Okay, <laughs> so, right, so Octavia's out as a lesbian. Mm -hmm. All her characters, and then I mean all her characters, are strong black women. Yes, they are. All right. So the cover of Dawn, you know, the first of the exogenesis, you know, has a white woman. Like, <laughs> okay, so wait a minute. <laughs> the character's black. She's a you know, black woman writer, so why did you have a, you know, that's, that's a marketing thing by the you know, publishing company right. to do that, right. to, you know, market Absolutely. her books. But, I mean, in education, we call that, you know, to put on the educator's hat now, the, we call that hidden curriculum. Mm. So it's not just Columbus discovered America and that you don't know. He discovered Indians, right? Well, what was the name of the people from their point of view? What was the name of the island? So the Taino is left out of the narrative. Guanahani is left out of the narrative, even though these are people that gave us words like canoe, hammock, barbecue, iguana, <laughs> hurricane. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's all left out of the narrative. So the other piece about hidden curriculum is where is the student's voice in what you're teaching? 
Yes. How do they find their story in what you're teaching and what is left out? And do they feel left out? But you have to create the space for it to happen. Yes. You can't just be firing r curriculum down their throats right. without, you know, in being more inclusive. It, it, well, it's hard for the kids, to, people, participants, to do this kind of deep work, and then it's kind of over. Right. You know, when it will be so useful if it, this could be used, this kind of work could be used as the beginning. Right. As a foundation I mean, to build something real if, on. Yeah, I mean, if you're starting from somebody who's saying, you know, I can't write, then they've been told they can't write. And they, be, I mean, they. And they believe it. And listen, and some of them can't write. I mean, some of them can't write, like yeah, you know, literally, literally yeah. write. And and but we didn't let that stop us. When we had those kids, we wrote for them, we scribed for them sometimes because it was about the story. They right. they had the story. They just didn't have the tool. Yeah, to, or the skill to, to write it down. But to, they could tell it. And that's what I tell right. every kid who tells a story and every person who tells a story. You carry the story of, you don't know how many other people. Yeah. You know? And so when the kids get up or participants get up and they share their point, their narrative, there's like 100 people who had the same experience but didn't have the know-how or the confidence or the whatever to tell their story. Yeah. You know? For example, I mean, so, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you the question about the black kids, but I mean, all right, so you have rich white kids in a l rich white school, right? Now, as a drug counselor, I actually expect there to be more uh, sexual abuse and drug abuse and death in those families behind the look good, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. that one kid who is, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, brother died horribly. I mean, mm -hmm. that was a horrific thing that in the American way of death, you're not taught how to deal with that grieving process not or anything. And yeah, you would have sexual abuse. And even though we have safe touch in elementary school, that does not give narrative voice to those folks. Uh, now, especially considering that sexual abuse is most often committed by somebody that the kid knows. Right. Or is a relative. So, so or, yeah, all the right. warnings, they're right. like going, but that doesn't count for Uncle Charlie. Right. I know him right. or, or or Uncle Carrie, the best friend of my dad or right. something. You know, it, it doesn't always translate. So yeah. they're not always getting that. Yeah. So you let off with Henrietta. Slave yes. narrative. Yeah. I mean, and it's a classic one and it's a, you know, sadly a typical one. It's an American story. Right? And, and let me tell you about that story. That my grandmother told me that exact story. Uh, years, I can't even tell you how little I was when I first heard that story, and then I heard it over and over again. Then I heard about this WPA project where they wanted to get an oral history of the slaves before we were all dead, mm -hmm. and um, and they did that. And this is this woman Henrietta Story, which is also the name of my relative. Mm. It could be my relative. Right. Um, and people go, well, it's such a horrible story. But you weren't told that, necessarily. No. But it could be any of our stories, really. It, and and yeah. that's the real right. truth. It could right. be any of our stories. And, uh, and now it's funny with all the genealogical stuff that people <laughs> are doing and finding out how connected we actually are. So who is the second character? What second character? What do you mean? Was that you? Was that your story, the second piece you did? Just now, A Conscious Life? Yeah. Oh yeah, that was you. That was that was that was my story. Okay, yeah, all right. yeah. Okay, they're all my stories. Okay, and then um, I'm I'm hoping that I wanted to make that clear. Yeah, that by telling the okay, stories. Okay, what's the connection? Thank you, thank you yeah. for that. Um, by telling the stories, um, you know, there is that healing in the telling. So um, I got to witness this firsthand with my grandmother, because my grandmother took me everywhere. So. I often tell, the, tell students that I will tell them, that when they're finished with their narratives, I'm going to tell them a story standing on my head. Hmm. And they think I'm going to put a story on top of my head. I mean, they think all yeah. the different things, except for the fact that I'm going to get on my head and tell a story. Yeah. You know, and I tell the story about my grandmother, you know, who decided to stop driving when I was 16 so that I could drive her everywhere. And it was great because I went around and, with her, and she would meet with her friends who were some of who were maids at different house, you know, houses, and 
just that life, you know? And it would just be, so here I was integrating a really rich, wealthy, white school on one hand at, you know, at 16, and there was my granny and her friends working in the houses the, of the classmates that I was going to school wow. with. Try that one okay, on. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that was a huge responsibility. So when I go into the school systems now mm. and I see the one black kid in class mm -hmm. and I'm talking and, they're, and you can see the whole body language, no, don't, don't highlight me. Don't I'm already, go there. Don't go I'm there. already highlighted enough. This is hard enough. Leave me alone. I mean, you can hear it, yeah. you know, and, and I felt that, you know, as, a, as, a, as an integrator of, you know, of different schools and places, you know. So, um, so anyway. So, um, I actually had a question about that because, um, you know, in terms of how you came to that work, you came by it naturally because you were mentored to do that. Now, my family was one of the first black families to integrate the Haight-Ashbury. Really? Yeah. <laughs> um, about the same time, in the 40s, so mm -hmm. about the same time, Willie Mims, who's like a local elder in the black community here, mm -hmm. um, his family moved into the high street area of Eugene. And uh, you have a story, um, and basically petitions were circulated by the neighbors in the Haight-Ashbury and in High Street to try and get our respective families to move out. Yep. To move out. To move out. So and you the, have a petition story. What was the incentive to get you to move out that they tried to use for you? Well, so far, they well, basically, they used petitions and picketing. And fortunately, there weren't firebombs or crosses. Right. This is right. San Francisco in the 1940s. Right. Not that the Klan isn't there. Uh -huh. But, you know, and ultimately, the Klan was definitely in operation in the right. 40s in Eugene. Right. But, you know, right. hey, they had been sold. Uh, the house by, you know, this Jewish man, and yeah. <laughs> hey, that, that was it. That's Bought it fair and scare. Yeah. I'm yeah. an American. Boom. Leave us alone. We right. ain't leaving. Bye. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it, it really is like squatting, right. <laughs> you know. Um, so, so when I was five years old, I, I did learn what the word petition meant, and I learned it the hard way. I could not figure out what this was about, why they would care what color skin that we had. To move to live next door to them, so I was five, and and it didn't make any logical sense. Racism is real, but it's not. Yeah, doesn't make any sense. Right, <laughs> that's what, what I always say about still it. Still don't make any still sense. Still don't make any I'm sense. Double nickel, but it's real. <laughs> well, you know, and maybe, you know, ultimately it's not real in the bigger yeah. picture of life. You know, we're, we're not victims of this, um, but um, so my next door, our new next door neighbor started a petition to keep us out. And they raised the price, they did all kinds of things, I found out later. Um, and we got the house. Everybody, I mean, it, was, it took a village. Yeah, right. So we got this house in this wealthy, white, all Jewish neighborhood. So we were not only the only non-whites, we were the only non-Jews. Mm. So in, in the whole neighborhood. Mm. So, and there's been... The Schwarzes have come to town. Uh, so we to were thick in the middle of the neighborhood. So then when the riots broke out and... Which town was this? This was in Cincinnati. Cincinnati, Cincinnati okay. had some serious riots yes. going on yeah. there. And we lost a lot of wonderful people to that struggle. I mean, just people that you don't know, that aren't Martin Luther King Jr. or something, but that are... I know, I know a rabbi who was my, the father of one of my friends got shot, you know, trying to help us. Mm, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just all those horrible things <clears throat> that happened. So what I did was I just went next door the first day that we moved in there and I knocked on her door of my neighbor, the one who, who started the petition. And I said, um, she said, finally she came to the door. She didn't come to the door right away. And I knew she was watching me. And so you were five? I was five years old. And she opened the door and I said, Mrs. Schwab, because I knew her name, I said, why don't you want us to live here? Why don't you like us? And that's what happened. She just, it was just complete silence. She was frozen in the doorway. And then she started to cry. She just burst into tears. That really freaked me out. So I started to back away. And, um, you know, um, and she said, come in. Come on in. 
I'll have my maid get you some Muslim cookies, some Muslim cookies. And the, the truth black of Black maid? Black maid. Okay. Black maid, <laughs> I'll never forget her. Okay. And, and uh, um, so every, you know, every Saturday night after that, she just broke open. I think it was the innocence that I came at her with, just broke through. Um, and I wasn't angry with her. I just was really coming from a place of needing to understand right. this. Right, childhood innocence, curiosity. Childhood innocence, and it just broke and it down. And you were the perfect ambassador to do that, really. I, ultimately, yes. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that it's okay for people, for little people to be responsible mm -hmm. and things like that. Because sometimes out of the mouth of babes, it is best yeah, coming. So it's logical to start with children. To start with children, yes. absolutely. And um, so she goes... So every, every Saturday night, she'd pile all of us into this midnight blue Cadillac convertible that she had, and she'd wrap a big old bright scarf, and we had this giant beehive. Remember the beehive mm -hmm, hairdo? Mm -hmm. The giant nest of things that people wore in their heads, you know? And um, she looked at us, and she said, well, you know, at least you're not Catholic. <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> well, okay. You could have been, but I, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So what about the black kids then in schools? Or did you talk about that already? Well, I just, I, there's something, I, I addressed them, some of this from my own experience in my one woman show, but um, what I'm seeing is a lot of biracial kids, especially, yes. calling yeah. themselves colored. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this? Yes. Oh, good. Except yeah, I was just no, 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 it, no, no. It, it's like, wait, are we South? Is this uh, South Africa or is this the 50s? So I had to 40s. take a breath. This was yeah. a non. The first yeah. time this happened right. was a non-writer. Right. right. And and he wrote something. He wrote. You know what he wrote about? He wrote about holding his father's hand, walking down some stairs. His father was black. His mother was white. He lived with his father and identified with his father. And some man, white man, screamed over the balcony, "You nigger!" And he was only eight at the time, mm. and he saw how his father just shrank, mm. just died, you know, from that, having mm -hmm. that happen mm -hmm. in front of his kid. And that, and you know, that's something people don't understand all the time, just that you're vulnerable out in the world. You could be right. out in the world thinking your own thoughts, living right. your own life, and somebody yells at your nigger outside the mm -hmm. car door or something, mm -hmm. which has happened to me mm -hmm. here. <laughs> <You know? gasps> it actually happened in, actually in Corvallis. In, o in Obamastan, post-racial America? Yeah. Yeah, it's all up to be healed. Okay, it's okay. all okay. up to be healed. Right. I really believe that, you know. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, so the, what I'm saying with the black kids is that, is that they need help, and a, a lot more mentoring going on. Where, because so, what I said to him was, how do you identify? What do you feel like? What do you feel like describes mm -hmm. you? Not mm -hmm. what anybody else imposes on you. Mm -hmm. And he said. Well, Negro? Hmm. And I said, no, mm -hmm. honey, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and then he said, well, what do you, what do you well, say? Well, okay, but the, all right, so, because we're of an age, right? Uh -huh. So we remember when it was um, the evolution between colored, well, nigger, right. colored, uh, Negro, mm -hmm. Negra. Negra, <laughs> I was going to say, don't leave that one out. No, I wasn't, okay. <laughs> Nigra, then after Martin got killed and James Brown wrote in response, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. proud, and we became black because in the Negro and colored days, being called black was an insult, were, was fighting words. And right. Then we embraced being black and then right. Afro-American and African-American. So I know white people are going, what the hell, can yeah. they not just make a decision and stick to it? Well, there's an evolution based on having to fight, yes. you know, these negative things. I mean, there was a piece on CNN the other day about, you know, they replicated the, the Clark's, you know, doll thing except with pictures, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. you know, show me the smart kid, yeah, show right. me the kid that everybody likes, mm -hmm. the, your parents like, and, you know, there's a range of colors there, et cetera. And That's what disturbs me, that here I come back into the schools 20 years later right. or however years later, and the same stuff was going right. on. It's like I never left. Right. It. Right. I mean, and so that's you know what what becomes an issue is in terms of right. Well, how do you identify? Can you check the box? Do you check the box? Do you mm -hmm. select? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you select? If you do select, I mm -hmm. mean, you know, uh, 
where I come down on you know, having raised children is, look, if you're subject to attack, you pick the most defensible position. Mm -hmm. Right, and so my daughter, my daughter, my biological daughters basically say, "Look, we're black women. You know, yes, our mother's white, but no, we're black." As you know, uh, the youngest one who's 22, yeah, I got called nigger bitch. So, mm -hmm. you know, complained to the Human Rights Commission. You know, they could, you know, even though they knew where the dudes lived, you mm -hmm. know, they couldn't do nothing because it's well, whatever, you know. Yeah. But so, and what's what's a real shift's going to happen is us. Yeah, people like us doing what we're doing. Is but but not only us because the the rich white kid that got empowered to tell their story, having heard your story, can now tell that and say, look, you know, we're all black kids in the sense that one, according to Alice Walker, black means you care. Mm. So if you care and you defend people that are less powerful than you, mm -hmm. that's what makes you black. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, there's a difference between a Thurgood Marshall and uh, right. Clarence Thomas. Right, right. <laughs> right. Okay. Where do you stand, you know, defending the weak against the strong or mm -hmm. not? Or do you care? Right. You know, right. do you give people a voice? Can you give people a voice? And then your, your stories and that whole process, how does that process work with adults with a, in adult workshops? It's interesting because adults have more barriers. Are, are they, in, in that, not that they won't do it. It's that they, they want to please you. Mm -hmm. They're worse than the kids that way, mm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. because they've been much more socialized. Yes. So, so sometimes it's harder to mine a story from an adult. On the other hand, sometimes it's easier because um, there is more experience and material. Certainly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They have more experience, but a lot of the same questions. Like a lot of people ask me, well, I'm conf Tell me, because. Because I go into groups all the time and, and, and do and hold groups all the time about things like this and and they're like, I am confused. What what do I call you? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> genuinely asking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's I it's what I always tell kids is if you're confused about something, ask an appropriate question in an appropriate way, which you can ask, you know, and um, um, you know, so Well, I ask this that question in this way. What are your bloodlines? What are my bloodlines? Yes. All right, so I'm still kind of investigating the whole native piece because okay. that's a huge piece for me. Okay. Um, I, it's the math. You could do the math. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, blood quantum was not actually supposed to be applied to human beings. That was a trick. Yeah. But, yeah. But, so, so you got native. Yes, a lot of native. Okay. My, my grandmother on my father's side was, is, was a full Seminole. Okay. My grandfather on my father's side was half black half Cherokee mm -hmm. so they were more native than black mm -hmm. um, and then my grandmother her father was from Ireland okay. and he in that time married quote married he treated her like a wife not like a slave, or like a slave. Yeah. and they were burned alive in their homes mm. um, fortunately my grandmother and her brother were not home mm. But they lost both their parents and everything they had. Where was this? This was in a place called Junction City, Kentucky. Whoa. Not necessarily and so my the Junction City, Oregon is different. No. But, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. And, she, and she looks white, my grandmother. Mm. looks. So people used to say, is that your real grandmother? Yeah, right. And I go, no, I rented her for the, for the holiday. <laughs> I mean. Well, you know. Damaliel has rent a Negro, so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. so um, I just want to facilitate the conversation mm -hmm. and the questions, um, and and to continue to help empower people um, with not just finding the voice, but truly using the voice yeah. to m yeah. to create change, to be responsible for your voice. Mm. You know, I watched in the last class I was last classroom I was in. I watched. The black one black girl in the classroom shift, and she came out and she gave me a big hug, and she said, "I love the show. I love the show, and I yeah. love the class, you know." And 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 so I just felt like a million bucks because yeah. I reached that one kid, that yeah. one black kid, you know. And and then she just opened up and participated, you know. But she kind of had to do a little bit of thing just be between me and her. Yeah. And and that's okay. Go to slide. So speaking of show, uh, she's, Shelly's got a show 
coming up on May 22nd, uh, this, this Saturday. This Saturday at 7.30. 7.30 uh, at uh, the Mandala Studio in Corvallis, uh, 6227 Northeast Pettibone Drive in Corvallis. Uh, a premiere showing of Born to Walk Between Worlds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be also speaking at Linus Pauling yeah. as their graduation keynote speaker. So I All get a right. chance to say thank All you right. to the 250 kids we served there. All right. That's a lot. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. If you like what you've seen, tell a friend about this show. Uh, send us an email at diversityv at, lane C at live class at lanecc.edu. Put diversityv in the subject line. Uh, tell us what you like and tell a friend. Until then, go well, stay well. <laughs>